Hello, in this lesson we will explore the practical applications of fundamental integration tools, specifically the technique of substitution or variable change in integration by parts. The objectives we aim to achieve primarily involve exploring the practical applications of these fundamental tools and reinforcing the periodic evaluation of integrals. In other words, our focus is on functions for which direct solutions are not readily obtainable, but where we can identify a certain periodic pattern that facilitates finding solutions. The requirements include understanding the concept of primitives, being able to calculate indefinite integrals, and of course, having a grasp of integration by parts and the change of variable. The lesson will revolve around the computation of this integral. We give this integral a name, which is the sign of the natural logarithm of x with respect to the variable. The first thing we notice when attempting to solve this integral is that it involves a composition. We have the sign and logarithm, and our goal is to make the integrand as simple as possible. Why? Well, simplification allows us to apply properties and find the primitive functions more easily. The sign of a logarithm represents a composition, and therefore our objective is simplification. So we immediately consider a change of variable, which is the key to simplifying integrands. When thinking about a change of variable, we also need to determine what we should assign to the new variable. What is it we are going to call t, right? Well, in this expression, two terms are present. Firstly, we have the scene function, which stands on the outer side, and secondly, we have the logarithmic term. Whenever possible, we aim to perform a change of variable on the innermost part, the part that effectively includes the variable. The sine function does not contain the variable, rather, it's the logarithm that encompasses the variable. So, having said that, the logarithm of x becomes our primary candidate for applying the change of variable. This does not always have to work fine every time. It's merely a method, a tool that may guide us toward a solution but might not always succeed as well. And we must be okay with it regardless. Well, we make the change, t would be the logarithm, and now we calculate the dt, which is simply the derivative. The derivative of the logarithm is 1 divided by x multiplied by dx. And it is now when we can apply the change of variable. Let's remember that in order to do that, what we have to do, firstly, is where there was a logarithm, we add a t, and secondly, where there is the dx, we add the dt. In this case, if we simplify, we notice that the dx actually is x dt. But of course, we have to have it all in terms of t, that's the reason why the x has to be changed. How do we transform this x? Well, let's notice that in the first term within the brackets, we find that t is equal to the natural logarithm. Since t represents the primitive function of the logarithm, x is the exponential of t. These are inverse functions, the logarithm and the exponential. Therefore, if t is the natural logarithm, x is the exponential function. We can make this substitution as indicated in the presentation and therefore continue forward. Once we get to this point, we find out that this integral is a product of two functions, the sine and the exponential. These are two functions that are initially unrelated. In essence, the derivative of sine becomes cosine, and the derivative of exponential remains exponential, right? These are functions that, at first glance, have no apparent connection. Therefore, the fundamental technique that becomes relevant is the integration by parts. Typically, one of the components is referred to as u, and the other component is referred to as v dv. Remember that what we refer to as u should be something we intend to derive. Conversely, d or dv should be something we intend to integrate. That's why it's essential for u to be an expression that is easily differentiable, resulting in simpler derivatives, and for d or dv to be expressions that we can integrate so the integrals don't come out to be too complex. It's worth noting that the approach is not always as straightforward as it may seem. There are strategies where it's interesting to differentiate complex expressions and integrate complex ones to make everything fit together. Nevertheless, these are the fundamental principles to follow. In this case, both the sine and the exponential are easy to derive and integrate. Therefore, we could do it in any possible way. In this example, I have chosen to call u the sine and the dv the exponential. Let's not forget that the dv goes with the d of the variable. In this case, the dt. Once we have the u and the dv, we simply calculate the du, which basically consists in deriving, and the v, which consists in integrating. The integral of the exponential is no other than the exponential. Once we've reached this point, what we do is to apply the formula of integration by parts which is the one we have right here on the screen. The integral u dv is the one that we already have built. It would be the sine of t multiplied by e raised to t, and of course the differential of t. That would be the integral that we have to calculate, so let's get started with the formula one step at a time. This would be equal to u, which is the sine times v, which is the exponential minus the integral of v, which is the exponential times the differential of u, which is the cosine. 
Well, now that we have reached this point, we realize that we have a term, the scene times, the exponential, and we have also gotten an integral that is very similar to the one we had above. Before we had the exponential times the sine, and now we have the exponential times the cosine. Then, what we are going to try to do is the following. Let's try to apply again the same integration by parts on this exponential times the cosine, in hopes that we get something that allows us to make this whole integral easier to deal with. By the looks of it, this integral is going to be complicated. If we do the same process again, we are going to have an integral like the one we had before, of the type sine times exponential, and for that reason, we might struggle a bit. Despite that, let's proceed. The integration by parts is the same again. We would take the u, the cosine, and the dv would be the exponential. It is important that when we apply integration by parts twice, we do not make the change backwards. Let's not put now the cosine in the v and the exponential in the u, since we would be, in a way, undoing what we had already done. Well, we calculate the du, we calculate v as well, and now we proceed to apply the formula. The sine of exponential t stays as it is, due to the fact that it is not in the integral, and now we add the minus u and the rest of the formula. Once we have arrived here, we have simply finished with the application of the formula of integration by parts, and it is time for us to simplify. We would simplify the parentheses a little bit in a way that we are left with the sine times the exponential minus the cosine times the exponential minus an integral, which turns out to be the same integral that we had at the very beginning. In other words, it is the integral i. Once we have this expression, we notice that i is equal to something minus i. We don't immediately obtain the value of i, but we can isolate it by moving i to the other side through addition. When we do this, we observe that 2i is equal to the sine of the exponential minus the cosine of the exponential. Well, that is precisely what we have already written. However, in this case, we have written directly the change of variable. Again, we have undone where there was a t, and we have put the logarithm along the rest of the expression. And now we might ask ourselves, how much is i worth? Well, in order to know that I just have to pass the 2 dividing, so the integral i would be that whole expression divided by 2. What happens here is a basic simplification. The sine of the logarithm stays as it is, the cosine of the logarithm stays as it is, but the exponential of the logarithm appears as x divided by 2. We can see it at the beginning of the expression. Let's never forget that once we do all this calculation, what we are actually doing is calculating a primitive. When we finish calculating that primitive, what we have to do is to always add the constant of integration that gives us all the possible primitives of the function. This has been the example. After today's complicated lesson, we should be able to apply the fundamental tools of integration, change of variables, and integration by parts. In conclusion, I also wanted to add that, hopefully, we should also understand that integral calculus is more similar to a form of art rather than an exact and definite process. That has been all students. Thank you very much for your time and attention.